Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our channel. Uh, my name is Mark Fisher, and uh, this is our Scientology Stories, Peeling the Onion. And I'm here with my friend, Janice Gillum-Grady. How are you doing, Janice? Good. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for coming back to listen to more of our stories. <laughs> That's right. And, uh, you know, we're really happy with, uh, you know, we got quite a few subscribers off of our first video. So if you haven't subscribed yet, please hit that subscribe button. And also, we got lots of really great comments on our last video. Um, we're going to, we answer, I tried to answer some of the questions, you know, back in the comment section. But if you have any more questions, please do so, you know, just ask in the comments and like our video. And uh, soon we'll be having live streams where people can actually ask us questions live and we'll be happy to answer them. Um, we even got some questions, Janice, from as far away as Australia. Yes. Somebody asked, uh, oh, I'll ask this question of you. Somebody asked, where in Australia are you from? You know, I'm from, uh, I was born in a little sheep town called Euroa in Victoria. Yeah. Uh, but the rest of the family was from Brisbane. Oh, okay. And then um, you, and that you lived there, you're born and raised there up until what age? I left Australia, Melbourne, when I was, I just turned 10. And uh, we went to England because, of course, Scientology had been banned in Victoria, so it could no longer be practiced. And my mother had been declared, which is a whole nother story to tell in the future. <laughs> um, my first dealings with having to disconnect from a parent when I was uh, nine years old. And uh, anyway, so we went to England and then I was there for a year and a half at St. Hill before we went to the Sea Org ship at the age of 11. And that's, again, more stories to come. <laughs> okay, well, so we shout out to all the Aussies out there, okay? <laughs> yep. G'day, mates. <laughs> all right, so the, the subject, the story we're going to tell today is, is twofold. Uh, number one, we're going to talk about uh, there was a secret Scientology location in the late 70s where L. Ron Hubbard lived with his family and with his staff and close personal staff uh, for some time. And uh, we're going to uh, tell about that. Janice lived there and was there. So we're going to tell that story. But also we're going to cover uh, David Miscavige when he first, after he first joined the Commodore's Messenger Org and uh, when he first saw L. Ron Hubbard, which was at this secret location. And then, um, you know, up until the time when the last time he probably physically saw L. Ron Hubbard. So that, that's what we're going to cover today. And these, this is kind of the early, early history of David Miscavige and his relationship with L. Ron Hubbard, as well as the secret location. And uh, we're going to show you photographs and also a map of the place. And Janice is going to tell some stories about that. Okay, Janice, you ready? Okay, I'm, I'm ready. Okay, so tell everybody about what, it, what was the name of this location and where was it? It, we called it Winter Headquarters, or WHQ, and it was located in La Quinta, California, just outside of Indio, 15 minutes from Palm Desert, half an hour from Palm Springs. And, and when, when did he buy, or when was that purchase, property purchased? Um, you know, let me just go back a little further. After LRH left Clearwater around March of 76, when he was exposed as being in Clearwater, he went to Washington, D.C. And then he moved from Washington, D.C. just early summer of 76 and set up in, L he was out in uh, L.A. area. And uh, he had the GO, the Guardian's office, looking for a location for him where he could set up permanently. And they found um, some, uh, probably four houses all next to each other in La Quinta, right next to the La Quinta Hotel. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had the hotel with a golf course and swimming pools and stuff like that on one side of us. And then there was us, and then we had mountains. And when we did sell, the, the hotel bought them up and it's still La Quinta Resort now. Right, and uh, one of the things, uh, what, what was the uh, location like? Uh, you know, what was kind of the conditions then? Because I know it's much more built up now. I, I mean, I've been there since, and I know you have too, but what was it like when you got, what, when you first got there? When I first got there, um, we were surrounded by date trees, uh, citrus trees, alfalfa fields, there was not a lot of, the area was not built up at all. It was just the hotel and then us, a few houses straggling around. 
Uh, it was pretty much in the middle of nowhere. And it was deserty, right? Yeah, it was very deserty. Yeah, and actually before I got there, they had a major flood and um, there was basements that they were, you know, sandbagging off, trying to save from flooding. So um, that, that was a little excitement before I got there. Okay, I'm, I'm going to put up a map. This is a, a map of the, uh, you guys called it W, right? Or WHQ? Yeah, it was WHQ, but we just called it W for short. And, and it was the winter headquarters. Winter headquarters. And on this map, you can see in the top right corner, I've kind of shown the location of it uh, where it says La Quinta, uh, you know, just just south of Palm Springs. Right. Right. And it's uh, it's 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 a little ways from Palm Springs. But, yeah, it's the La Quinta area. And um, and now it's like a, like you said, it's part of the whole La Quinta golf course and resort. And then yeah. this is a layout of the of the property and the buildings and where they were located. And I'm putting it up there so that people can see it and stuff. But basically, just just describe people what were the what were the buildings and and, and yeah. You know, how, okay, how well, let me kind of point it out. At the top, it says palms, like in the middle. Up here. Says, well, I don't have anything to point to. Oh, okay, you can't see my cursor. I'm sorry. No, I can't. Sorry. That's fine. But um, so there's palms, and that's where our course rooms were. Auditing was there, and our dining room, and a kind of a lounge. Mm -hmm. um, and so then um, going below that, you see Olives. And uh -huh. Olives is where the the messengers had their office, the guardian's office. Well, it was actually the controller's office. They worked for Mary Sue. They had their office there and external comm for all LRH communications going out was also located in Olives. Uh -huh. And then um, just to the left and down, there's what two adjoining rooms i and um jay uh, that was uh, where the messengers lived and suzette uh, hubbard had her own room there and okay. then Kay, Kay was arthur hubbard's uh, little house okay and then uh you can see where it says garden and alfalfa field i actually told a story when i was talking to um a, a. ron uh, a couple of weeks ago in there, I told a story about Hubbard and the nutritional sticks and the gardener, and that's where that incident happened. And I can go into that another time okay. in this series. Then if you go down through that alfalfa field, those paths going around, you come to um, where it says rifle at the bottom of the picture of the diagram. And that is where LRH lived and had his home an office and Mary Sue lived there as well. Let me put up, I'm going to put up a photograph of rifle. Can you see that? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, that's the house, right? Yeah. That's the house rifle. That's been altered a little bit where you can see that blue door that used to be a regular door um, to go through or it's behind the trees where we would walk in and out of and then LRH's office was right there on the right-hand side where that window is in the middle. Okay. And then but, here I'm going to show a, a aerial photograph of yeah, the rifle, the rifle property, picture. right? Yeah, up in the top of the picture by the road, those were what were called stables, and all of LRH's furniture was stored there. And, and it had a U-shaped drive. You could drive in and around. And then at the house, you can see the swimming pool. And the house was actually behind. It was all walled in. Um, the outer walls of the house were also, you know, the walls of the yard. It was all surrounding. And um, I can't point to anything, but. I the, understand. Describe the it, I right guess. The, house, the top right of the house is where his office was. The bottom right-hand side is where the guest house was uh -huh. and his and his actual bedroom was in that far bottom right hand corner okay and you'd come out of the guest house wing and there's the swimming pool and you'd walk over to the other part of the house where the kitchen was and the living room and dining room mary sue's office his office mary sue's communicator nikki also had a office there i see and uh he lived in that house with mary sue correct yes he did 
and they both worked out of that office. Yes. Well, right. out of the house. Yes. Yeah. And at the time, and it, this is what, 1978? Uh, this is 1977. He 77. moved there in late 76. And uh, this was 1977. And he lived there until July 1977 when the FBI raided the Guardian's office in Los Angeles and D.C., at okay. which point he took off to Sparks, Nevada at that time, and Mary Sue remained there. Right. And and Mary Sue was, she was the guardian. She was the head of the uh, Scientology legal department and investigation department and all that. And uh, the FBI, of course, they raided the Scientology offices in order to uh, get all the information they can because Scientology had been running and uh, a spying operation, an infiltration operation to steal government documents out from government offices. And uh, that's the, there was a huge raid, for those that don't know, that happened um, in Los Angeles and also up in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, it eventually resulted, we're not going to go into all the details, but it eventually resulted in Mary Sue being convicted and having to go to prison along with uh, several other people. And L. Ron Hubbard, even though... Uh, you know, he was involved with it. Uh, he was he was basically an unindicted co-conspirator, and he he never never saw any jail time or anything like that. But yeah, this he, property, let me just comment on this, Mark, because yeah. he did when he was up in Sparks, he he did keep commenting to the messengers that were with him that he knew nothing about it of what the Guardian's office was doing. He was trying to plead right. his innocence to them, but there's right. evidence showing otherwise. Right. And then um, not to get down the road, what, what with Mary Sue and him, they basically lived there. But then after he took off, were Mary Sue and him ever together again? Or did basically he had to keep his distance? I, I don't I don't remember the story on that. You know, they didn't live together again, but they did visit each other again. Okay. Uh, they visited here. And uh, also once we moved to what is now the gold base. Uh, Mary Sue and he would meet there. Got it. And then um, the other thing, too, is now it's all built up and everything between it. But I remember you telling me stories. Uh, it was a walk or, or quite a walk from Palms to Rifle, right? Did, did, were there any dangers that you had to had to watch out for? Rattlesnakes. <laughs> Rattlesnakes, right? <laughs> Rattlesnakes was the biggest danger. And, and riding, there was no lights at all. And we would ride these bikes and you couldn't see and you'd end up in a ditch, you know, <laughs> riding there. Or um, I, I had a dog, her name was uh, Babe. Uh -huh. and, uh, I remember Babe, yeah. She would always escort me and she would wait outside rifle for me. My whole six hours of watch, she would sit there and wait for me. And then she would escort me back to the, you know, the main locations. But if anyone was coming on that path and Babe saw them, she just start this big throaty growl, so you know I always knew I had my protection. That's great, and and they the they actually L. Ron Hubbard wanted to do uh, films, movies at the time, right? Uh, he had written treatments for different training films he wanted to shoot there, and that was the beginning of the um, actual movie shooting, isn't that right? Yeah, but that all started after after the the Guardian's office got raided. And he went off to Sparks. While he was in Sparks was when he wrote Revolt in the Stars and decided to start getting into cine and the movie business. And so he then would send down directions for us all to study cine and learn the camera and lighting and makeup and all that kind of stuff. And we were to be ready by January 78 for when he returned. And Mary Sue had to leave W before he returned. So that's when they found her house in Los Feliz and she ended up moving down there. And once that was done, he then returned to W and started doing all the cine shooting. Got it. Now, um, there was a date packing plant, right? Isn't that what they used as sort of the studio? Yeah, there, yes, there was a date packing plant where all the dates used to be packed that were taken down from all the palm trees. Mm -hmm. And at first that was turned into a recording studio and um, LRH used to go there and work on editing his old lectures, 
you know, the wall of tapes that he'd done back in the 60s. And he would edit that for any crackles and pops and just to make him smooth them out and do any intros or voiceovers. And he did that there. And then when he returned, we then turned it into an actual movie studio. Got it. Got it. Now, and then how about the messengers? Like you were a messenger for L. Ron Hubbard. So um, you all had duties there. And basically, did you work outside of his house because his office was there? Or, or what, what was entailed for the messengers in those days? Yeah, well, we, we stood our six hours of watch with him at Rifle or wherever he went. And we would even would drive him. We had all but learned to drive by that time. And we would drive him from one location down to one of the other locations and he would then do inspections or whatever or do his voiceovers. And then when we weren't on watch, we also, everyone had areas they were assigned responsible for and would do, be a project ops and run those projects. Uh -huh. And uh, I ran different projects, Gail, Didi, uh, David, Dave Miscavige, David Rousseau ran different projects. And that's how uh, Miscavige actually ended up becoming a mission ops and running external missions was from doing external projects. I was one of the first projects he ran. Uh -huh. This actually has a funny story to it. Yeah. But I was assigned to do a project on uh, personnel executive resources. And I had to go to flag and go through people's files and find resources who were executive qualified to get them into training. Mm -hmm. And Dave was my mission ops. And while I was in clear, what I was work, I was working long hours from like late eight in the morning till nine at night, ten o'clock. But while I was in Clearwater, I met Dave's brother Ronnie. Uh -huh. And Ronnie and I and some of the other messengers would go roller skating at nighttime. We'd go down to the roller skating rink and just have a great time roller skating and kind of get us away from the long hours. Right. Well, Ronnie and his big mouth somehow word gets back to his brother <laughs> that I'm on mission going roller skating. <laughs> so it's a big no, no, right? That's a big no, no going off and having fun while you're on, on a project. How, how old were you? Th do you think you were then? Um, I was probably 20, 20, probably 2021. 20, yeah. Yeah. So you, you wanted to go have some fun. I understand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't drinking or anything. We were just roller skating. <laughs> anyway, I get this telex telling me to go to cramming for, for taking time off while I'm on a project. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is my cramming officer was Ronnie. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, the one who ratted you out? The one who ratted me out had to then cram me. And uh, anyway, it was just funny. And then when I got back to the base, LRH says to me, oh, I heard you were off roller skating. I'm like, who told him? <laughs> the only person that could have would have been Dave. I understand. Let me show a couple other pictures here. This is a, this is a picture of L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, around that time out at uh, W or whatever, right? He's uh, yes. sitting on like a dolly for a, cin uh, a cinema camera. Is that correct? Yeah, that would have been in 78. 1978, right. Yeah. And then uh, uh, you guys had to be incognito out there when you were at the W base, right? Because it wasn't known that it was a Scientology property. Is that correct? Right. This is where we, we dressed. We all wore civilian clothes. The boys all wore they grew their hair. They wore cowboy hats. Wore there cowboy you go. Hats. There you go. Arthur and my sister-in-law, Doreen. Who Arthur was, Hubbard. That's LRH's youngest son, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that's pretty much how we dressed. Was yeah. Just, just, you know, for the late 70s, 78, that was the style. Long hair and uh, flannel shirts and that type of thing, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and then also, gonna... as part of it, everyone had to have a made up name. We never had that before, but so everyone had to come up with a name and uh, so that if it was known that you were with Hubbard, if you used a fake name, then you weren't with Hubbard because, you know, you were right because people might be looking out for us. Do you remember so, your fake name? 
Well, I I didn't. I just had Jan. Uh huh. Uh, because if I was with Hubbard, we didn't want him making a mistake and trying to remember what my fake name was because for ten years he'd always known me as Janice. Right. So I just if I introduced myself to anyone, it was Jan. Got it. Where on the base I was still Janice, but other people, you know, like someone might have been their real name was Ron. And then they change it to Clifford or yeah. it's like Gary, Gary Moorhead. He is Jackson. The name Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone had, and people had different names, but not the messengers because we didn't want to create confusion for Hubbard. I understand. And then here's another picture. Now this is a picture I don't think anybody's seen before, um, but uh, tell, tell everybody what's who's in this picture and where this is, where this is at. Okay, well, the, this is a photo of the date fields of where we lived, and you can see the mountains in the background. Mm -hmm. And um, that's my Mustang there. My brother, sister, and I uh, owned it. Our dad had given it to us. And that's uh, Shelly Barnett or Shelly Miscavige. And next to her is uh, David Rousseau. David is a, was a long-term messenger on the ship with us, and uh, we called him DR or David. And so when when Miscavige showed up, we now had two Davids. So it became Dave and David or DM and DR. And right. that way we knew who we were referring to. But LRH, the way he distinguished DM, he always referred to him as the kid. The kid. Right. The kid. He that's what he called him was the kid. Because he was he was like 16 years old. He was the yeah. youngest. And yeah. Yeah, DR almost looks, David Rousseau almost looks like David Miscavige there from a distance. Um, but that's Shelly. Shelly has to be 17, 18 years old there too. She's got to be very young. And, yeah, she was uh, probably 16, 17 at that picture. Right. And uh, to tell you a funny story, I mean, David Rousseau, he was a great guy. I, I knew him really well uh, for for uh, some time. I went at my one time I was in the rehabilitation project force. He was in there and as well as with his wife, Claire. Rousseau at the time, and uh, he was a really great guy. But uh, uh, David Miscavige, you know, he he was referred to as DM to you know as opposed to DR, and he he did not like to be addressed as DM. People would uh, when I worked for him, uh, people would refer to him when he wasn't there. And this is before he got all hoity-toity and was the chairman of the board or CLB was throwing his weight around. Um, we just called him, he liked to be called Dave. And I used to call him Dave all the time, even though he was my boss. But uh, if you, you didn't call him DM to his face, he, did, he didn't particularly care for that. Yeah. No, we always just called him Dave. Yeah, he was he was Dave. And that, yeah. that may sound funny to some people, you know, because of, you know, uh, the big ego that uh, Miscavige has now and everybody calls him Sir and COB and all that. But, um, you know, the, at this time, you know, they were teenagers um, and basically, you know, friends and get, got along and you call people by their first name. Isn't that right? That, that's correct. Yeah, we were all, we're all, you know, between 16, 19, 20. We all hung out together. We would, we would coordinate to who would be driving the car and driving us all into town on Liberty, you know, or if we're going to go in a tubing down some river, who was going? And we'd all go together and hang out together. We'd go to swap meet together. You know, it was just a group of good friends hanging out. I heard you guys also used to go into Palm Springs to the discos. Is that right? Yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you have to be 21, I think. <laughs> that's funny. Okay, yeah. so let me ask you now. Okay, David Miscavige, like he, that's when he first arrived and would have met L. Ron Hubbard. Is that correct at W? Yeah, he actually, st he arrived um, in the Sea Org in April. April, early May. 76, yeah. Yeah, 76. He had just turned 16, dropped out of high school because he was going to go and join the Sea Org. And um, Lois Riesdorf actually is the one who recruited him into the CMO when he had arrived at the base mm -hmm. because she was like, hey, he's young, you know, let's get him into the CMO. So I was actually in Clearwater at that time in command of the CMO office in Clearwater. So mm -hmm. Dave was assigned under under my command and he did the the basics and everything like that. 
And then after being there for a little bit, he did his first mission. And that was a mission mostly into the flag service hall, but it was also had to do with other things around the flag base. Okay. And that's the only mission I remember him ever doing. And it actually was a failed mission. Yeah, he was on that mission with Sue Sue Walker, right? I thought it was, yeah, Sue Pomeroy Walker. Yeah. Is who, whose mission in charge was. Yeah. And she was a well-seasoned missionaire, mm -hmm. but this one was a failed mission. Got it. And then what was his duties like? Or do you remember like when you first, like, can you recall your first memories of meeting uh, Miss Gavage? Well, the first met, time I met him, he was sitting down on a chair talking to Lois as she was recruiting him. I happened to have been at the base at that time. I see. And then later he worked for me and mostly he did project ops. You know, he'd have a bunch of steps of uh, things to get done, and he would go and get people to get those steps done. And that's what his job was. And he became uh, close with another messenger who was about the same age as him. Her name was Tanya Burden. Uh-huh. And uh, Tanya and Dave were boyfriend and girlfriend. Yeah. And um, <laughs> a funny story later on, <laughs> when um, years later... We always at Christmas time would do what we call Chris Ki Chris Kingle Kringle Chris Kringle yeah or, or KK yeah and you would be a secret Chris a Santa Claus and we would send secret messages to each other and you had to try and guess who your KK was and um, Julie who you and who you were married to or, yeah this was uh, Julie Catano this was my future wife. Yeah, so you weren't married to her yet. No, no, no. I, right. I just had started working for Miss Gavage in the corporate liaison office. Right. Okay. Well, this was Julie, my first duty. This was my first duty. Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> your first duty. Okay. Well, Julie was the KK for David, for Dave. And he was mostly in LA working on legal matters and trying to get um, all clear so LRH could come back to the base. And that right. meant getting all the legal resolved mm -hmm. so and we're up at management so we don't know what's going on with the legal but i found this photo of dave and tanya and tanya at this time years later was now suing lrh in the legal courts right and i said hey julie i've got this picture of dave why don't you send it you know on your kk note well she's oh great okay and so she sends it to him. Well, um, I got to tell you, the, the picture is a picture of Dave with his arm around Tanya Burden. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting anyway. on a couch. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Julie sends this picture off as part of her KK notes. Next thing you know, it must have been about six execs from ASI showing up at Int. Yeah. Wanting to find out who Dave's KK was and who sent him this picture of him and Tanya Burden, enemy number one to the Church of Scientology. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, it's just a joke. Can't you guys take a joke? But no, Julie ended up, I think, in a condition of liability for that. Yeah, from my end of things, I was told to go get Julie and bring her up. Uh, you know, Dave and Shelly, you know, like you said, they were mostly in Los Angeles, but they came up and I literally had just started the day before on my new position. And um, when Julie came up there, Shelly did not like it at all. Um, apparently, apparently, I didn't know this, but Julie had been Dave's girlfriend at some point, I guess, after Tanya and before Shelly for a while. I don't know. that. That's what I, my understanding of it was. But Shelly basically reamed out Julie about, uh, you know, uh, I know you're jealous because, you know, I'm with him and all that, but don't you ever do something like that again? And she got really angry at her. <laughs> yeah, and I just kept saying to people, it was a joke. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but anyway, so now there's the different positions, like when you worked at Rife, with L. Ron Hubbard at Rifle and all that, you were messenger on duty. You you were a senior messenger. But what was what was Dave's position? Was he ever like a, a you know an on watch messenger on duty? No, not that I remember. I remember um, I sent him there in January '77. I got a telex saying, "Hey, I need from LRH saying he needed some new messengers." 
So I sent Dave up there, and I think it was January 77, and then I was pulled up there in April of 77. And when I got there, he had not been standing watches, but he was what we called traffic messenger. There was no LRH communicator to filter through any of the communication particles being sent to Hubbard. Uh -huh. so, so Dave was given that job of filtering through everything. So he wasn't standing watches. And when Hubbard went places, he didn't go with him. He just stayed in the office next to his and went through stuff and kicked it back or got it completed and then was forwarded into him. I see. And, uh, he never, by the time Hubbard left, in July of 77, Dave was still a, a messenger in training. He wasn't even considered a junior messenger at that point. Okay. All right. And then how did he eventually got on? He was, he eventually uh, was put on the video team with the, with uh, doing the cinema, the movies with L. Ron Hubbard, and then eventually the cameraman. How did that come about? Well, when LRH was in um, Sparks, that's when he wanted all the messengers to train on different subjects concerning Cine so that he had us able to do everything. And uh, Dave and Mark Yeager went on video and my sister was put on camera. And uh, so when LRH showed up and started shooting, Dave was covering the video so that they could replay things and just watch what was happening rather than waiting for rushes to come back for the day that right. they could rewatch on the video. And then he eventually moved over to take over the camera position, right? Yes. Yeah. I, I um, you know, he, he used to brag about his ability as a cameraman. He actually did have ability shooting photographs and that type of thing. But, you know, the, those, the movies were, you know, they weren't the greatest movies in the world. He later, uh, you know, years later, uh, Miscavige, actually talked down the, the movies that L. Ron Hubbard had shot as being very amateurish and not very good. But uh, let me ask you a question about um, Miscavige. Like, what, what was he like personally at that time, like interacting with him? Like, did you ever see him, you know, how he later got a reputation, deservedly so, of being, you know, he, he would uh, get very tough and angry with people and uh, had a bad temper. What was he like uh, in those days? You know, he was, he was a, a teenager, but he could get intense, uh -huh. uh, intense and determined and yeah. pushy for his own way. Mm -hmm. But he also mind his P's and Q's and he was, he was just one of us. We all would go to the movies together. We'd just hang out, you know, uh, we'd play wrestle and um, he wasn't aggressive but you could you could kind of see that every now and again as as a mission ops or a project ops mm -hmm. trying to get things done right but right. he wasn't he wasn't like he he is now and, the, and that heavy duty ego uh, that he has now was not there um, did he ever get in trouble <laughs> yeah he got in trouble we all got in trouble but i remember him actually getting busted because he got in a car accident uh -huh. close, close to the base, so it was considered a major security risk. And uh, he and uh, Pat Broker got busted around the same time, and they were all they were both out in the vegetable garden picking tomatoes, and planting you know vegetables. Yeah, he exactly. got through cleanup because if you get in an accident, you've got to redo car school, which was a a course we had to do on learning how to drive and all about the car engine and what to do in different situations. Right, right. And then eventually, um, I remember, you know, Miscavige became the, what was called the action chief, which was basically, he was the person who ran missions that were sent out, you know, to different locations for the Commodore's Messenger Org. But right. then eventually you guys all went to uh, Los Angeles to the Big Blue and PAC and were running um, missions into every organization. And that's when I saw him again, Was I was pulled out there as a missionary, as a mission missionaire, sorry, not a missionary, um, and sent on missions. And you guys, why were you guys all, uh, the whole, you know, all the messengers were sent away from W, right? And they were they were sent out to, uh, to LA, right? 
Yeah, the Guardian's office uh, didn't want us there. There was some inspection that was supposed to be done, and they did not want the messengers to be there because then that would have connected Hubbard to the base. So, and so what happened is Hubbard was in Hammett at an apartment building that we referred to as X. And that was near Gilman Hot Springs where the, the eventual int base was located, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and even when Hubbard was at X, nearly every day he drove into the base and would shoot film at nighttime in the upper reservoir. We had that set up as a studio. Mm -hmm. And then he'd go back to X. And we had messengers who were with him at X. But at that same time, with him being so moving off the management lines, that's when Hubbard said to set up watchdog committee. And uh, so Gail and Dee Dee and Lois and Dave and uh, Mark Yeager were the first ones setting up on watchdog committee. And because they had a lot to do in managing internationally, they weren't with Hubbard at X. As they were at the beginning of the original setup of moving him there, but uh -huh. once they went into the management, they were no longer going out there, except for every week, Lois and Mark Yeager would go up to X and take Hubbard the international stats and go over those with him. I see. Take all the notes. But I don't remember Dave being a messenger at X. Uh, okay. He did. He was sometimes on the set, but not at X as an actual messenger. He did not have a long period of time with Hubbard um, doing day-to-day -day activities with him. And in those days, he was not in charge. Like he, he wasn't what he is now chairman of the board and leader of Scientology, there were people who were senior to him in the Commodore's messenger org. Is that oh, right? Ab absolutely. Yes. Yeah. He, he was, well, he wasn't even a junior messenger, uh -huh. you know, or he was just starting to get that status right. because he had not been with Hubbard. And even when Hubbard wasn't shooting Cine, because there was a period in late 78 that he got really sick. Yeah, he stood some messenger watches then, but that was not doing any of the day-to-day -day management involvement. You're dealing with a sick man. Right. And that was a lot of what he had to deal with in his training, but it was not, you know, the regular type. How did Hubbard really operate on handling things? Right. And Hubbard, he he actually got really sick, didn't he, at, at, at uh, W, um, to the point where like he was pretty serious is that right yeah he was seriously ill where claire uh was the messenger in charge at the time and she actually ordered david mayo to come to w at that time and audit lrh and um and that and he did he audited him and he started he recovered from it yeah and i mean didn't, didn't he really claim i mean mayo basically helped save his life isn't that right Yes, he did. Yeah. Yes, he did. And then, of course, later, years, you know, a few years later, he got David Mayo was, you know, basically kicked out and was the biggest traitor and the biggest enemy of all time. Yeah. Right? yeah and that, that's pretty normal. Uh, if you look at Hubbard's history with people that get close to him, they eventually become the enemy. Right. And he could throw, he had a temper, he had a big temper too, couldn't he, uh, L. Ron Hubbard? Oh, yeah. He, he had a major, huge temper. Yeah. Very fiery think, temper. Do you think that Miscavige, you know, was, I'm, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, do you think that he was imitating L. L. Ron Hubbard a bit in terms of how he uh, dealt with people with his temper and that type of thing? Yeah, because he didn't know any better. And he also, you know, he also, apples don't fall far from the tree. Uh-huh. And he came from a, a family where his dad was abusive. Uh-huh. Right. And, you know, that's he grew up with that. Well, let me ask you this question, okay? Based on the amount of time that uh, that David Miscavige spent personally with L. Ron Hubbard, you know, years later, it was claimed, oh, he, you know, Miscavige is like the big friend of L. Ron Hubbard and, you know, he'd been around him and all that. And so naturally he was the one to take over Scientology. Was that, in your opinion or your experience, uh, correct? No, not at, not at all. 
Uh, Dave has spent very little time with Hubbard, did not really experience how Hubbard handled different situations. He experienced Hubbard in a time period when Hubbard was, well, he was sick. Right. You know, and so he saw a, a very angry old man at that point, but he never saw him in the earlier days or anything like that and never got to see a variety of how he operated. Right. And, um, and it was actually the way Dave mo slowly moved into power was as the mission ops, he had a mission which was called a uh, corporate sort out. Mm -hmm. And these were instructions from LRH where they were to sort out all the different Scientology corporations and echelons. And those were all to be put into place so that everything could operate on its own without Hubbard. Right. And that's where you had the Executive International and you the ED uh, International, and you had the Watchdog Committee, and and it was a small RTC and, and a, a small um, spiritual um, technology. technology. Yeah, yeah. Spiritual yeah. technology. Right. Um, it's been so long. Yeah. But it was... Dave's job to get that all sorted out and the corporate structure all put in place Got as it. the mission ops. And right. that has all since been taken out by the same person who was held responsible to put it in. Yeah. And eventually the thing was, is that he was supposed to get an all clear for L. Ron Hubbard. Hubbard wanted to come back to the, what is now the gold base, the international base, and continue to do his movies and his sound and his research. But he couldn't because of all the lawsuits and the IRS uh, was, you know, there was a criminal investigation of him, uh, you know, saying that he was basically getting all of his money from Scientology and, that, you know, they were criminally investigating that. And he never got the all clear before L. Ron Hubbard died. Right. And basically, it, it, you know, We'll go into in a, in a future episode in terms of how that all occurred and, and you know how he eventually took over. But he right. was not the person who was in charge that was dealing with L. Ron Hubbard in back in those days, in those early days at W. I mean, there were more senior messengers who spent more time with him, with L. Ron Hubbard on a daily basis. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely correct. Yes. Who, he, were, the senior, was, who were people that were on watch with you with L. Ron Hubbard most? Um. Well, uh, you know, different time periods, different people. Right. But, but most, Didi, was Didi Didi in charge then? Pardon? Was Dee Dee in charge then? Was she the yeah. CEO? Yeah, yeah. Dee Dee Riesdorf, right. Dee Dee, Dee Dee Riesdorf, her sister Gail, uh -huh. Lois, myself, my sister, Claire. We were How about like Annie? You know, yes, and Annie. And then Pat, stuck, you know, when Pat went to Sparks with LRH, then he came back and became a messenger at that point. I see. And... And because Pat and, Pat and Annie got married, that was the only reason they got selected to go with Hubbard in the first place. When because, he took off from X, right? Yeah, because Kim and Michael would have normally done that, Kim and Michael Douglas, but they had blown. So then it was discussed between the messengers, okay, if LRH has to leave again, who's going to go with him? Well, I'm like, don't pick me. I want to have a life, you know? <laughs> Because you knew that if you were going off with him, you didn't know when you were coming back to civilization. And you basically were living incognito and hiding. Exactly. Yeah. So that's when it was decided, well, Pat and Annie are married. So, and they're both Pat messengers. Pat and Annie broker. Yeah. yeah, Pat and Annie broker. And they're both messengers. So they were the ones selected that if Hubbard had to leave, they would go with him. And that way the rest of us were like, oh, good, we can have a life. Yeah. And of course, they were with him up until he died, you know, yes. and Annie, Annie particularly. Uh, yeah. But we'll go into that into a future episode. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, please, I, 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 this is where we're going to leave this story. But whatever happened, though, with the W property, the, the, the property in La Quinta? Oh, it got sold to the La Quinta Resort. Uh -huh. And actually, a month ago, a friend of mine sent me a photograph of himself at the tennis courts. And I'm like, Oh, that's exactly where our swimming pool used to be. <laughs> and he had, and in the background was the old Olives building. And, yeah. and then I said, turn around and you'll see where I used to live. Yeah. So I, um, 
I went there one time. We had a birthday party there for, I think, Mark Ingber or Mark Yeager or something. And I went with David Miscavige and everybody. And we went and stayed at the La Quinta Resort and played golf. But then I remember going with David Miscavige and some other people. And he showed us around olives and palms and where Rifle was because we had never seen it. So I remember yeah. doing all of that. Um, yeah. Listen, everybody, I wanted to t say um, we really appreciate you watching our story and watching our channel. And uh, we would like you, if you would, please, please subscribe to our channel. Uh, so we're going to be doing quite a few more of these stories and things that you, you haven't heard of before or seen before. So we'd really appreciate you uh, subscribing to our channel. And I also wanted to mention, too, your book, Janice. Janice has got, she wrote two books, and this is the first one here. And it's Commodore's Messenger, book one. And uh, let me take this down here. Sorry. Can I just comment? Yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, LRH at this time period, you see how I'm dressed. Um, you know, we didn't have much money. We made like $5 a week or something like that. And we had to pay for our own clothes. But my pants, I call those my flood pants <laughs> because I was growing. <laughs> and my shirt's way too big. Yeah. And, and Hubbard used to call me a little waif. Little waif. Okay. A little waif. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so that's book one, and then she wrote a second volume, and this is the the book two, right? Yes. And that there you're a little bit older, and we we talked about that on the last video. But yeah. if you all are interested in ordering her book, you can or either book, both of them. Uh, there's a link in our descriptions below um, uh, for Amazon.com. You can order either one of the books on Amazon.com. There's also a link on our on our um, YouTube page too for the audio version of book one. Uh, you did an audio version of book one and that that's also available. So if you're interested in reading more and we're talking detailed stories, which are really great from Janice, uh, please order the books. Terrific. Yeah. So Janice, um, do you have anything else you want to mention before we uh, end? No, we appreciate your support and we're looking forward to uh, building more and more and telling you more stories and getting more support from you. So thank you very much. Yeah. And if you have a question, please ask it in the comments and I try and answer them, you know, uh, by text. But also if they're an interesting question, like the Australian one that we were asked, that we'll answer them in our next video. But I just wanted to let everybody know that we really appreciate all of that. And again, please subscribe to our channel and uh, we'll try and keep getting the stuff out to you uh, as we move forward. Okay. One more comment to the Aussies. Yeah. Where I say that I was born in Euroa. If you don't know where that is, it's Ned Kelly country. You all know who Ned Kelly was. <laughs> Good night. Thanks, Janice.